Andy Fenton. Happy New Year. Uh, happy New Financial Year. It's really yes, the thing. What, what a financial actually, year it's been, eh? Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> who would have thought? Who would have thought it again? Actually, one of my team members was saying it's her favourite word. I don't even know how to pronounce it. What is it? Eophis. Which? What, what? Say that again. That uh, that one of her favourite words is Eophis. End of financial oh, year. Oh, they all Oofus. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, I get it. Because of, uh, because of end of financial year sales. <laughs> <laughs> now it makes all right, sense. Andy. Okay, now it Andy. makes okay. sense. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, while we've got a few people jumping on, folks, welcome, everybody. Good to see everyone here. Andy's just gone and you there. All right. He's back. Yeah, uh, jolly good. Uh, there's Alison, as always. Welcome back to those who join us regularly. Good to see you guys. Uh, Jason Andy here back in the saddle or in the wagon. I don't know what the saying is, we're, but we're back together. Uh, it's been a few <laughs> weeks in a row where either Andy's been solo or I've been solo or it just hasn't come together, but uh, happy to be back with you, my friend, and um, welcome back to those who are uh, coming back, coming to see us hang out on a Friday at Wealth, Wine & Wisdom while we're uh, getting all warmed up and uh, people are jumping on. Quick, do the intros. Uh, Andy Fenton, Jason Witten, as it says down the bottom in our little name tags. <laughs> uh, and uh, we've uh, we've been holding a bit of a weekly debrief since the beginning of COVID, uh, helping our respective communities in the world of property and the share market. Andy in banking and equities and shares for over 20 years. Me in the world of real estate for over 20 years, helping our clients and customers do the best they can and uh, be safe, but also be on it when it comes to investing. So, um, you know, we've been debriefing for a while and certainly in and around the world of business owners is one of the the niches, the worlds we play in as business owners ourselves, as property investors ourselves, and as equity investors ourselves. We've got a little bit of a, a unique understanding of how a few of those things go together. So we get together every Friday, do a debrief, Andy. We've got a few people Diving in, diving in today, and uh, Laura, good day. How are you? And uh, Bob, Bob's here. Bob's a regular. Good to see you, Bob. And Michelle, Michelle's down in Melbourne, which is uh, which is great. But mate, Andy, the only place not in lockdown, mate. It's uh, uh, it's a cruel <laughs> and unusual twist of fate, whereby I, I do believe it's a conspiracy theory. I I believe that uh, the rest of Australia has just gone. Look, Melbourne's come out of lockdown. So let's all go into lockdown so they can't travel anywhere because we were we, we were thinking, oh, school holidays, we're off. We're going to go up to Queensland. We're going to go to uh, – and who would have thought, you know, because when it started happening, I was thinking, you know what, I was always in Northern Territory. There's all – and then <laughs> Northern Territory <laughs> went into lockdown. I'm like, you can't be serious. It's unbelievable. Uh, Usually the wall was originally built around Victoria to uh, stop us from leaving and spreading the virus and then it was uh, to keep everybody out. It's uh, it's unbelievable. So we're, we're still here, not travelling, not in lockdown, but not able to go anywhere. There you go, Andy. Well, um, a few people are jumping on now. So g'day, Karen. Uh, g'day, Chris. How are you, mate? And uh, Deanne's popping on by. Andy, there's two of you right now in your screen, and um, which is wonderful. Uh, um, it's uh well you know you, you can you can be pretty lucky well, can't you? Well, I think uh, here we go. We we could uh, we could do the dueling dueling twos. You could you could put yours back, and then we could have sort of double. <laughs> uh, there you go. Oh well, Alison said she went to puck a punyal today. Gee, um, sorry about that, Alison. Um, there's not much out there, that's for sure. <laughs> yep, you just see you just see all of the cadets doing their military stuff out there. Absolutely. But, folks, uh, listen, uh, as we do, we get a chance to sort of uh, catch up with you guys and have a bit of a chat, have a bit of a yarn about uh, what's going on. And uh, in our travels, we thought we would uh, try and make a little bit of sense of what we get up to on these nights and um, we sort of get around to it in a few ways. First things we do is sort of debrief Andy, what's in the news. Um, that way i got to get my, yeah, what's in the news. So, hmm. <laughs> All right, yeah, what's in the news? So we'll have a little look at that uh, in a minute, folks, and sort of say what's in the news. While we're doing that, we'd love you guys to sort of think of any questions that you might have. Uh, certainly, we've had a few questions over the weeks, 
and we've stored up a few of those. Andy's going to talk about end of financial year and starting the new financial year also, things to remember to get off to the right start and maybe finish off. Um, and uh, also we've had a question about life insurance and the appropriate cover when borrowing. So we're going to sort of jump onto that a bit later on as well and um, make sure you're here for that uh, team because uh, because it's a, it's an important one. And then uh, we might do some stuff like things you should know uh, a little bit later on. Just depends on how we get rolling. But so that's the the gist of the show tonight, folks. So um, um, what we uh, what we do is try and give it a bit of structure. So Andy and I don't waffle on um, without <laughs> aim <laughs> because we do like to catch up. But uh, certainly what's in the news is always interesting, Andy. And uh, I thought I might sort of jump in on this one and kick it off at my on my side and then uh, you can uh, have a little little nudge at uh, you know what's going on for um, uh, your neck of the woods but uh, let me have a, a bit of a look at what's in the news uh, right now here um, in and around you know the property market um, uh, and it's not necessarily uh, hot off the press sort of stuff right now to be honest but um, the reality is for many of us um, Finance is uh, is um, uh, certainly for property investors. Finance is something we've got to keep an eye on, and uh, there's something interesting going on with the amount of volume coming through. This is a chart. It's a uh, it's a little bit older, but right now we're seeing um, huge amounts and and massive amounts of owner occupiers back in the marketplace, Andy. And uh, a lot of people are thinking, "Oh, well, that's that's great," but uh, it's actually loaded up with one style of owner occupier right now i'm doing a little bit of a pop quiz ladies and gents a bit of a pop quiz pop quiz Jeez, um, geez, I love these. Which, which type of owner occupier is out there getting financed like there's no tomorrow like um um uh oh, no, i was trying to come up with a, a non rude uh um, <laughs> saying, I just got to come up with <laughs> no, it. It's Friday. Just pretend like we've had a few more to drink. It's all over it like a rat up a drain pipe or whatever it might be. Um, but uh, yeah, owner occupiers, you think, oh, gee, everyone's upgrading their home. Um, but that, uh, that technically not the case. So uh, a little pop quiz while we're having a bit of a chat. Investors are still well behind the eight ball when it comes to finance recovery. But Andy, what we are seeing, and I've, we've seen it probably for the last maybe, you know, Two to three months, really good um, investor offerings, interest rates, and also flexibility in the investor space. And one of the things that I do love when it comes to us as property investors is interest-only offerings at the appropriate time at the beginning of your lending and your acquisition phase, not forever. You certainly want to reduce your debt at the appropriate time. Um, but uh, what I do know, and both Andy and I, you know, help people with their budgets and their cash flows often, um, sometimes you can't do both. You can't, you know, get the second property or the third property and pay off the debt at the same time because it consumes mm -hmm. too much cash flow. So uh, sometimes you've got to balance it up, get the get the second or the third property and then get on to the debt reduction. Yeah. Um, so what we are seeing in this space um, with the investor, uh, the investor's making a comeback, Andy, is that um, we're getting lots and lots of good offerings again. We're getting the 90% offering back out there, which I do like. Certainly when you're in that first sort of one to three properties, getting your money working a bit harder and faster for you is great. Um, and the interest-only offerings out there in the marketplace, which are pretty good. Um, you know, right now I did this mathematics for one of our buyers. Uh, we've got one in common, Andy, uh, a client, and uh, the – interest only calculation for them on a brand new property uh, after tax they're on they're on a pretty good income uh, is thirteen thousand dollars positive cash flow in your pocket <laughs> on a brand new property you know it was like wow that's just that's just mind-blowing so you know and the interest rates are 1.99 percent for two years you know so um interest only fixed um so it's not too bad so out there there's some of those offerings for the right for the person who's got the right circumstance, um, that is coming back and uh, is looking excellent. So um, it's kind of like not hot off the press news, but it's certainly a bit of the news that I think everyone should be paying attention to right now uh, out there in the marketplace. And um, 
certainly one I think we should uh, we should keep an eye on. The other thing uh, is that uh, I, I was I was talking about it this morning, Andy, in my um uh, in my rant, my my morning rant. I had a bit of a rant this morning, and um, no. I'll, I'll whack myself down in the bottom there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you weren't ranting, were you, Jason? You don't do that. Uh, maybe not. Maybe me. But not maybe me, but uh, someone I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's not very good there. Um, <laughs> but you know, we. Um, I was having a bit of a yarn this morning and talking about the media reporting and he reporting on the property prices like it's the share market. Literally every day. Yeah, it's gone up. You know, one percent or half a percent or whatever. And I think, I think it's ludicrous to look at the share market that way, folks, or the property market that way, like the share market. Um, it's just it's just not as fast, even though, Andy, we've talked about it speeding up. Um, it's Ooh, certainly yeah. not as fast as the stock market, right? So, um, But one of the things that I was talking about, and you and I have chatted about it for a while, Andy, is that when property prices go up and wages don't keep up, the ability for property prices to continue to rise um, will be limited, and there's only there's only two things that can happen. You can either reduce the cost, which is the interest rates have gone down to two fifths of bugger all, or people's wages can rise. You know, one of those two, you know, interest rates coming down or wages going up, um, will allow people more buying power and capacity to buy. So, you know, what's happening out there? There's a bit of rhetoric. And I think um, uh, an un uh, an uneducated rhetoric around the property prices being reported like literally weekly and monthly, and you know um, even this little report here. Oh, have a look at what's happened to date this year. You know, for five months, and it's like this. Like uh, it's interesting, but it's it's not the way to look at it. But so, but my point is this one here, Andy. Um, wages are still a challenge uh, in our marketplace. And um, you know, fingers crossed, our economy kicks kicks in the next 12, 18 months, two years, three years when it comes to wage growth. Uh, but property prices right now will start to splutter, and you'll see the likes of Sydney run out a bit of steam when it comes to property prices and wage compression and affordability and yield and so on. So you'll you'll see the rents come back up is what what I'm what I'm sort of seeing. Uh, for stuff in the news, so mm. we're already seeing rents to come back um, uh, as way we go. So, oh, I haven't been checking the chat. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, oh, there you go. Gee, I was I was right into I was right into my uh, my rant there. But um, uh, Luke, I think you got it first first off the uh, off the off the rank. Um, there you go. Luke was saying, I know who those buyers are, and he's dead right. And it's the first home buyers. Have a look at that, Andy. Look at that. Um, it's uh, that was the boost after the GFC in yep. home buyers finance commitments, and have a look at this almost almost identical almost identical when it comes to the volume of first home buyers that are, that come out of the woodwork um, every ten years the old every ten years the government dusts off the old let's give the first home buyers a, a leg up <laughs> and it works. For uh, for a few months and gets things party, it gets the party started again. So, you know, there you go, um, uh, Luke. You're right onto it, mate. Good job, uh, and uh, away you go. So, it's an interesting one um, uh, as you go, uh, and you dive into the details of what is actually going on out there, and you know what what sort of sort of happening because it's not it's not the 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 person who's got their home. They're not upgrading, Andy. They're not. You know, selling the, this home and buying another one. It's the owner occupiers that are driving that new home buyer stuff, which is fantastic. You know, um, the government let people have access to their super. The government gave extra boosts. Um, I, I just helped my brother out, and he's ended up making money by buying a property with his partner. Like, actually made money. Like, after all said and done, put ten grand in cash in his pocket. <laughs> You're like, how's that? You know, <laughs> you have a free house plus a ten grand cash bonus. You know, <laughs> mate, it's going to be interesting looking back on this in twenty years' time, isn't it? It will be. It will be. It'll be one of those moments that people will will refer to and go, "Look, this is where it started." Whatever that thing, <laughs> whatever that thing is. Uh, 
It'll be but episode last but number least, 7,000 by then, I reckon. Oh, mate, I tell you. Yeah, it'd be interesting. But last but not least, in this sort of space, one of those things I think uh, I'm probably jumping on to sort of things you should know anyway, folks, but – you know, since 2006, this is a chart, a uh, bit of a shout out to Timmy Boyle. He's always uh, supplying us with some good charts. He's a, he's a good fella and uh, I love his his uh, his stuff that he, he provides us. But um, um, this is an interesting chart. So we can see when property prices kind of quarter over quarter um, have, have posted like a negative return, right? And, um, you know, you and I have chatted about this, Andy, you know, when the APRA, APRA stuff came in, APRA came in there and property prices, like property growth, not prices, but growth process or growth momentum, you know, went on a slide and it, and it posted the, the largest negative growth um, we'd seen, you know, in over um, 20 years, so mm. since 2001. So a lot of people sort of forgot about that one, um, was, wasn't as – Gnarly as uh, as the GFC or or post GFC when the first time buyers were turned off, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's interesting. We're back here now, and we've got a little bit of positive momentum. But the point is, folks, property prices or growth happens in a positive, and it happens in a negative, which is all completely normal and natural, just like the share market too. So, you know, um, that's my stuff, mate. Uh, for what's in the news this week. And uh, we do have a few questions coming through, but before we answer those, I think um, uh, I'll throw back to you and say, what do you got for us, mate? Right. Well, uh, it's uh, it's not not overly sexy, but uh, I think it's what everyone should be. Uh, should be no- there we go. Uh, what we should be t- paying attention to at the moment. And just to a, a bit of a reminder, because it is the new financial year and uh, – and there's changes. Well, they weren't ahead; uh, they're actually now. So, we've we've spoken about them for the budgetary changes, but let's have a little bit of a crack at at what's going on. The first one off the back is Super Ten. Uh, Super is Ooh. now up to ten percent, which uh, yeah. the business owners are not going to like too much. And uh, for all the journalists out there who are having pops at small business owners and saying that it's uh, it's uh, oh, I've forgotten the terms that they used unethical behaviour. You go and become a bloody business owner, all right? So, uh, unfortunately, for small to medium businesses, during a period of time where it is, uh, for many businesses, extraordinarily challenging, um, they're going to have to fork out an extra 0.5% into their employees' wages. So, one to look out for here is, depends on what your contract says. Uh, And they're calling employers employers sneaky. They're calling them unethical. Um, I reckon if you get the legislation right, um, then you're neither. Uh, it's it's just the way that it is, right? You can't have it both ways. Uh, so, look, for those of you who want to know what's going on there, if you've got a salary which is a package, so you've got a $120,000 package, well, yep. then your wage will not go up. You will get more super, but you will get less uh, in your pocket. And uh, and that's the way that it should be from a contract perspective. The uh, the government are actually coming out and making a little bit of a noise, and I I don't know the full clip on it as yet because the noise has only just started. But the government have come out and made some noise in and around uh, the appropriate pass on, and uh, and so this is them trying to have a double dip at their legislation because uh, ultimately, the way that I've read it and the way that I understand it is that uh, it is <coughs> it is ten percent super. Uh, on your salary. So if you've got a package, that means that you get no more money. But if you're not on a package, if your contract says, you know, $100,000 plus super, yeah. um, then it's $100,000 plus the $10,000 instead of the $9,500. So good for the employees to go out there and have a look at your contracts. Those of you who are in small to medium business world or employees of small to medium businesses, probably good to have the conversation with uh, with your boss as well. Uh, just so, A, remind them uh, because they can be, get busy and, and make sure that they're, they're on the button as well uh, yeah. and they can start budgeting for that. But also just to get on the front foot and have the conversation so that it's uh, that you you just know where you stand. Better to uh, better have the conversation than, uh, than let it run. So, mate, that's uh, that's the first one. And, and that-, that one. Andy, just quickly before you move on to the next one, um, uh, I know it's only talk, but there is talk about uh, super going all the way to 12%, isn't it? 
over yep. over the next decade. And um, you know, again, you and I talk about this all the time. You know, when we talk about you know how much money this is in comparison to a percentage of your earning life, um, you know, take super seriously, gang. Uh, you know, if you're receiving it, you know, it is an absolute golden opportunity to maximize your wealth into the future if you understand what to do with it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's going. You know, it's nine and a half, ten up to twelve. Is it twelve or twelve and a half? They reckon by by some. But I some reckon it'll, they'll keep on pushing it up because the figures are sort of sit in and around. If you want the type of retirement you need, it's somewhere between fifteen and twenty is what you need to be packing away. Yeah. So yeah. I reckon they'll just keep pushing that up. Um, so w- w- I guess we'll wait and see. We've got multiple different government changes uh, likely before that happens, or or Sing- maybe Singapore's twenty percent. Singapore's twenty percent. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but it, look, that it will be. It will have a bit of wage suppression if they do it too quickly, and that's the thing that they've got to be careful of because uh, ultimately, you know, businesses, and if you're in small business, uh, you know, cash flow can be tight. Uh, somebody's got to pay for it, right? And it's. Yeah. I think that there'll be a combination where uh, sometimes the employers are paying for it, and then sometimes it'll be the uh, employees are getting clipped on it. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see how that changes over time. But for now, yep, 100%, it's uh, now 100%, it's 10%, it's 10%, and you can take that <laughs> as 100% correct. Uh, it is 10% of your salary now. So just have a conversation uh, in and around it and, and yeah, get used to it. I mean, there's so many funky things you can do with Super now in that uh, yeah. you can get apps, you can trade your own shares, you can buy some Tesla in there if you're on the right platform. We've we've got a, a cracking platform that we use for a lot of clients that uh, allows you to, you know, buy your own shares and things like that. And uh, from my perspective, it, it, it also gives you, I mean, I don't get professionals to assist with the management of it, but um, but you can you can kind of take some interest in some things that are interesting. You know, and some great stocks are like the Tesla and then you've got your afterpays, which everyone was, you know, buzzing around. And I almost don't know anybody who didn't have some sort of a story about making some decent coin on afterpay. Uh, so, yeah, mate, I pay attention to it. It's getting up. It's going to keep going. What's, <laughs> what's this? Uh, absolutely. I think that could be Brian. If that's you, Brian, give us a shout out. You might be uh, coming in via one of the Facebook groups, but yeah, um, yeah, it's there's more flexibility in Singapore for your super. You can actually use it to purchase your home and for other things as well. So um, yeah, it's an interesting one. That stuff, um, you know, uh, you know, if we were to wax lyrical a little bit about, um, you know, our opinion on that sort of stuff. Like I'm a big fan of having somewhere like a super or other things where you could contribute to, which is a lower, a lower tax treatment, and um, certainly add some value to your own life. You know, in, in, in Australia and in many places of the world, your home, um, you know, I think, it's, uh, I think I read a stat the, the other day, Andy, up to 68% of, of the average Australian's wealth is in their own home. And, yeah. um, you know, while that's kind of good and scary at the same time, you know, we all know that, you know, having your own home gives a sense of kind of, you know, pride, certainty, you know, emotional well-being, whatever it might be. Poverty. Certainly, yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah. If, if you're buying one in Sydney, gee, I tell you, <laughs> well, Melbourne, yeah, well, there you go. Awesome. All right, well, mate, um, yeah, 10, 10, 100%, it's 10, it's on. Make sure you take your super seriously, gang. That's the that's the gig, really, at the end of the day. And just on that, mate, because you, you, you mentioned the property side of the equation and, and look, I, I reckon it would be great to be able to bring some rules around super to acquire property in there because as a part of a longer term wealth uh, strategy, the, your principal place of residence is 100% there. And there's so many other little strategies that you can use. A, it's a tax free asset and it's an asset. It is an investment, even though you live there, but it's yeah. tax free. Right, as long as you own it in your own name and it's your principal place of residence, hasn't been used as an investment property. All of those relevant disclaimers, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but a lot of the time we we use that as part of strategies for clients in order to be able to maximise benefits, maximise their tax position, uh, and then utilise that with super strategies. So you dwindle the super down, and then you you have an intentional downsize uh, built in there when you can't be bothered mowing, you know, or out and feeding the cows or mowing large 
bits of lawn and all of that sort of jazz that goes along with the sort of larger properties or, yeah. or hoovering uh, four bedrooms that never get used anymore, you know, all of those sorts of things. So it's it really is and should be a part of the, the overall wealth strategy for people for their longevity. And uh, I think that a lot of people miss it because they always go, it's the house and that's what it is. It's not. It's actually another asset that's in the kitty. Yeah, I completely agree, mate. You know, it's almost, you know, this is not advice, but, you know, it's the idea of like, 60 to 70 should be well funded by your super. 70 to 80 should be well funded by the PPR downgrade, you know. Um, and then the spare capital that you've created between the two of the, the spare assets would absolutely fund 80 to 100 very, very comfortably. So, you know, you know, at the end of the day, folks, you know, whether we all realize it or not right now, most of us listening in right now are going to live um, well beyond. 80 or 90 years old and you know we have to we have to fund it <laughs> we we have to fund it we don't want to be miserable um in, at that back end of life you know <laughs> what is, I, I remember billy Connolly saying you know in a comedy skit andy like you know what why do i want to eat bloody lettuce now and add add five more years to my life when i'm 95 he said that's rubbish Go hard now and, and drink and smoke right now because I don't care about adding five years when I'm eighty. I can't do anything with them, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's also he's also been known to saying, "I'm sick of people saying that uh, that life is short. It is the longest bloody thing you will ever do." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. No, that's good. There you go. Uh, so, nice mate, super super's number one. Here's some stuff that uh, that is changing. Uh, next, uh, sorry, this year. Uh, so we've now got, uh, so if we have a look here, we've got our balance transfer cap. So it was $1.6 million that you could have in super per person uh, and then turn that into a potentially a tax-free income stream. It's now up to uh, 1.7. So that nice. is there. That's a massive one if you're in that, uh, in your, if you're in that phase. Uh, and if you're in and around that amount, then you should be looking at seeing uh, seeing how you can manage that transfer balance cap. So the 1.7 yep. tax free dollars in super once you're above the age of 65 or above the age of 60 and retired was 1.6 million. Now you've got 1.7 million, and uh, we're looking at peppering that with all sorts of strategies uh, down the track. That's a right. absolute corker. We've then got uh, our non-concessional. Uh, sorry, our concessional contributions cap. And for those of you who get sick and tired of the government changing the name of these things every two minutes, but it's it's had four different names. It's four <laughs> yeah. different names it's had since. And you, you know what? You know what they changed? Nothing. What? Just the name. Just uh, the name. It was, uh, and I like the first one. It was a deductible contribution. You know, call it what it is. That's exactly and, uh, what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a deductible contribution or an undeducted contribution. That to me was perfect, but they've changed the bloody name four times. So anyway, concessional contributions, which is the contributions that are made by your employer, uh, or their contributions in which uh, they attract a fifteen percent tax on the way into super. Uh, but ultimately, you can claim a tax deduction yourself if you're uh, if you're contributing. So you used to have a maximum amount here, and this is a great tax planning strategy that people can use. Uh, your concessional contributions cap was 25,000. It's now up to 27,500. Uh, so that is great. I reckon this is going to continue to go up. I reckon it's uh, it's a sure thing that this is going to go up and probably should be going up more aggressively. Again, it was 35, then they brought it down to 25. Now they brought it back up to 27 and a half. It's like they just can't stop touching it. It's unbelievable, like a, uh, like a little boy. And menaces, um, menaces. <laughs> now explain, explain the next one because, you know, a lot of people ask me about this, Andy, like the non-concessional, like, you know, that's, so that is you can put X dollars in uh, from money that you've already paid tax on. Yeah, and look, and, and this is really interesting because there are, there are strategies where we are called re-contribution strategies, and uh, it, I would be bordering on giving advice if I went too too in depth in it. But uh, what a lot of people don't know is you we actually have a death tax in Australia, and a lot of people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And it was something I think it was Keating who opened the door to it. Uh, it was a little while ago now, and uh, and my history is is escaping me at the moment, but. Um, but money that has had a tax deduction that is sitting in super, 
is uh, is classed right is a is a is a taxable portion right now yeah. in the event of death and your super goes to a non-dependent so somebody other than your partner or it's unlikely that it would be children in the, your children have to be dependent on you financially dependent but uh if that goes to a non-dependent then they've got this thing anti-detriments tax and you never see it and nobody knows about it or very few people know about it the only people who realize it is that when they uh when they get given the check and they look at the super fund they go oh it's a hundred thousand dollars in super but i got a check for 85. where'd the other part go it's the anti-detriments tax so one way that you can you can get that get rid of that is to have more untaxed contributions uh, to the fund and so these are the standard non-concessional so the difference between concessional and non-concessional is that one is pre-tax one is post-tax so a concessional yeah. contribution is made on pre-tax dollars so from your employer or if you're a, you're a self uh, self-employed person that's money from your company that you put into super and you haven't yet paid tax anywhere on it uh, a standard non-concessional contribution is where the money's coming from your personal bank account so you've already paid tax at your marginal tax rate and that money goes into super that it has no uh tax attributed to it as it goes into super so if you put a hundred thousand in there's a hundred thousand dollars that reflects in your balance zero tax and it forms a part of your tax-free component of your superannuation fund so if you put one dollar more in than your hundred thousand dollars you breach the cap or you trigger what's known as the the, uh, the the bring forward provision, and uh, and if there's a certain rules that you have to uh, you know, pass, but if you're if you qualify, then you can make three years contribution in a single year. So, for example, there's some clients that we're using the strategy for now, whereby we've just done a hundred thousand dollars in the in the last month, coming up to the end of the year, and we'll now put three hundred and thirty in because we can use three years into the future. But then you can't make another non-concessional contribution until after those three years are finished. Yep, yep. And Andy, one, one last little definition on that one, which is um, which is for a few people listening in, maybe, you know, quite relevant. You can, um, you could use, uh, let's say you're at a, a point where you got, 200 in your super, you want to make sure you've got enough in there for a property, you've got some equity in a property somewhere, you could take some equity from your property and contribute it $100,000 into your super as a non-concessional contribution to boost up your super to purchase a property in there, right? So that's that's kind of there's, you know, other than that's not advice, folks, that's just that's just like strategy or, or um, concepts, but, you know, that's applicable too, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so people need to get smart now about how they're using the super because yes. there's so many little con – they've called it the simple super system, but they've really just made it spastically complex. Um, and it's, <laughs> it, it, is, it is really just – I mean, it, it keeps people like you and me uh, talking uh, because we, we obviously love diving deep into it. But for your average sort of Australian, it, it, they've really made quite a meal of it and uh, – uh, but it's worthwhile spending the time to wrap your head around because when you do, then you'll start to see that the strategies are there, but everything is longer term now, Jace. Like it used to be you'd go and see a financial advisor just before you're about to retire and we'd just go boom, 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 shuffle everything around, save huge amounts in tax, and then bang, you're you're off. Now, in order to achieve the same thing nowadays, you actually have to plan 10, 15 years out. And that's yeah. just the reality. The, 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 the potential for you to do incredible things is there but you've just got to be disciplined and you've got to take the long journey. And yeah. uh, it is as simple as that. Love it, mate. Um, and uh, obviously, if uh, a couple are together, you can you can combine these like concepts, you know, 1.7 turns into 3.4 and so on, right? And, you know, standard non-concessional turns into, you know, um, whatever it is, is it uh, 300 and, you know, 400 and, 30 each or something like that, you know, or whatever those numbers add up to. So, yep. you know, like yep. you said, you have to be smart, right? Yep. So that's each, right? Each for each member. Mm. There's my hieroglyphics. Beautiful handwriting. <laughs> Got that from the pen school. Uh, so, right. so, yeah, 100%. That's each. So you can, uh, you, 
line up your strategies, get your houses in there, whatever you want. Uh, that's up. Everything's up at the moment. Everything got indexed and largely wasn't even spoken about in the budget. And the other thing to be aware of now as well uh, is the eligibility for spouse offset uh, contribution and the co-contribution, which is uh, basically it's sort of tax-free mo or it's money that's gifted uh, to you by the tax man or by the, the superman, whichever one you want to call it, uh, to match certain contributions that you make into super. Now, you need to be below a certain wage threshold. So this isn't for hiring, higher income earners. This is for lower income earners. Uh, but just be aware that those are now up to the balance transfer cap of the $1.7 So, mate, th those are the key things that are actually changing in the world at the moment and everyone should be aware about and, and really starting to figure out what that looks like for them. And yep. uh, especially all of those people have gone out and made some uh, some good money on a lot of the properties. Uh, of recent, you can start to figure out, well, how can, how can you minimise your tax and uh, and things like that getting into the future? So be prepared, start planning. Mate, I love it. And, mate, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's my little what's in the news at the moment. Well, uh, mate, you know, it's, uh, it's always nice to know that uh, we have a few little uh, strategic conversations worth having when it comes to this sort of stuff, that's for sure. Um, but uh, you know, um, we do have a few people on the old uh, um, the questions. Any questions? We got uh, we got a few people quite keen on asking us a few questions, Andy. But uh, we have one here. Uh, I'll sort of scroll back up the top, and um, the first one from Bob, uh, and he says, "Like, what do you reckon? Is it better to buy some shares now or?" Um, wait for the blood in the streets. You know, you and I are pretty well long-term investors. We're sort of like buy well and keep an eye on things. But uh, what are your thoughts in the share market, mate? Mate, I I think that, uh, and it's again, it's not sexy, but it, it is pretty simple. And, uh, you know, those people who want to time markets, you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong, right? Uh, and the markets, I think it was Buffett who said, um, Markets can remain irrational longer than most people can remain solvent. Uh, so, <laughs> it's true, my, is it? <laughs> my, my take, on, oh, mate, the, look. To be fair, we've we've made some incredibly good timely calls, but a lot of the calls that we make are there's a significant amount of luck that goes along with them, and there's some decisions that we've made previously that didn't quite line up. And the trick, I guess, from the investment side of the equation is is just making sure that the strategic bets that you do take um, don't detract in a large way, but can add yeah. significant value when they do. And uh, and yeah. so being strategic about it. But from my perspective in the markets, it's just you've got to constantly be investing. Uh, and if you're constantly investing, you will, you will ride all of the market cycles. All right. So three, $350 a week, if you can punch that away and you get an average of about 7% return in 18 years, that's $700,000. Again, not not crazy sort of complex sort of stuff, but then you don't need to worry about market timing. You don't need to worry about these things. And um, and then if you want to have a little bit of a punt on some, on some stocks and things like that, whereby you're going to go into more high risk, happy days. You've got a strategy that underpins it in the uh, behind the scenes. And then you can have a little bit of a play. And, and I'm a big fan of that. I, I think that if people really want to be investing, then have a little bit. Have your fun account. Have your, 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 your gambling account, if you want to call it that. Something that you can have a bit of a punt, which gives you a bit more education in regards to you know investing in general. Because one thing that I do know is as soon as people start to pick individual stocks or start to do those sorts of things, their, their interest levels go up. They start watching. They start seeing trends. They start understanding markets a hell of a lot better. So, um, you know, is it now? Look, my belief in our markets at the moment is that we've had trillions of dollars pumped into the system, and I'm not sure that the, the price of the markets fully reflects that yet. Uh, but here's the other thing is nobody really knows what the end result of that's going to be. Nobody really knows when where that's going to end and and then whether something else takes over because, you know, we could go into a winter and COVID just really kicks in and rips through and all bets are off. That would scare the market. So I know that I didn't give you the answer that you probably wanted. Uh, spoken, like, because, spoken like a true politician, Andy. We were talking about this the other day. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, always be investing. That that is my be always. I be like that. Always be investing. It, it, it is true. Yeah, you know, I think I think that's the thing. Um, and uh, Bob sort of said same about property, right? So, you know, and for me, I'd echo exactly the same thing. You know, your long term strategy should always be happening. You know, buy some good things with some fundamentals and keep learning about what they are. Um, but your punt strategy. You know, maybe, maybe you know, you've got, you know, you got a bit of Bitcoin. You got a, you got a something that's 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 topical and out there. You know, um, maybe that's you know one percent to ten percent of your 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 capital, but you, you don't risk too much. You know, like the same with real estate. You know, it it goes where you want a foundation of you know three, four, five million dollars worth of good quality long term hold real estate. But if you've got a couple of hundred grand of equity, that if it all went up in smoke tomorrow. It wouldn't end your world. Well, yeah, invested in some, you know, small developments or some joint ventures or something a bit more, you know, 10, 15, 20% return potential, but it carries the risk with it, right? So yep. it's the strategy is similar. The implementation is is different. And and that's I think that's where people get the implementation ideas mixed with the strategy Andy the strategy is buy good quality things and keep doing it for a long period of time right um and uh you know, understand what you're trying to achieve yeah and you know the best way to protect yourself against market timing and market movements is in equities is to always be investing okay yep. I can't stress that enough and well and it took me a while to learn it really because again it's not sexy and it's not the big you know mind-blowing investment banking type of change the world approach but it's the most effective way by a country mile, an yeah, absolute yeah. country mile. Always be investing, and you will always end up better off. And you will get you will get the big booms, and you'll you'll get the the, the busts. And the the trick is to try and make sure that when you do have substantial amounts in there, that you do you know take a bit of risk off the table when it's the right time to. And certainly, we've taken some risk off the table now, uh, a little bit. And uh, but when we redeploy it, when when markets sort of fall a little bit, we put it back in. When uh, yeah. when they run a little bit hot, we we sometimes take a little bit of profit. So yeah, um, always be investing, Bob. That's uh, right. that, that's sort of my two cents worth. There you go. What what was that movie? There was a movie always be closing. Um, uh, I can't remember <laughs> what that was called, but uh, you know, always be investing. I like that. Yep. There you go. Um, Karen sort of said, you know, is the banking sector looking to ease? Some of the squeeze on investors, policies, et cetera. Um, certainly, um, certainly, Karen, we're hoping for that. But uh, what's actually happened is interest rates have gotten lower, which means servicing has been easier. But the policies have not changed; they haven't been repealed. There's been there's been talk about it, um, but those policies are still in place. So um, uh, it's easier to borrow, but it hasn't been because of policy. Like that's just the direct answer right now. There are some options. What we have seen is some new lending options come out um, that have nothing to do with policy in the in the non bank sector. Um, Karen, so certainly like the light dock loans are back in flavour, uh, and there's a few of the lenders, second tier lenders, um, offering those up. You know, and it's going to run you between four and. 6% interest rate in comparison to maybe, you know, 2 to 4% interest rate for a regular straighty 180 loan. So that's uh, that's what's happening in that space, buddy. Um, you know, unfortunately, Andy and I have said this quite a lot, you know, being a business owner, um, we don't get treated very well when it comes to lending, <laughs> which I is just, a real pain in the ass. Uh, I, just but, had the, uh, I just had what, a conversation, Jason. You, you'll, I mean, and if they're probably watching, so we're, we're obviously not going to use the name. But, uh, had the conversation, and uh, look, I was, we were we were having a good old laugh at it, but it's it, you know it's pretty horrible stuff because here, here's the reality: great business employs quite a few people, got a reasonable uh, ATO debt sitting behind it, and uh, and I'm like, you know what, you're better off employing your, your partner, paying her your wage, you take her wage. And uh, and then you get her to buy the house <laughs> because the the bank will lend her the money, but you've got you got Buckley's chance of get, of getting anything while you got the ATO debt. It's like yeah. get out, and I'm like that's just the way that it is, mate. And it's like, that's but I just fire her, <laughs> and then I'm like, that's exactly <laughs> right. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Zero sense. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, no, it it is. It's uh, it's crazy, Andy. But uh, any business owners listening in, give us a shout out. Andy and I can help you with uh, with those things if you need. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, oh, can't can't stress it enough. I think if you're a business owner, like you need to be chatting with somebody of, of like myself or Jace. Just the amount of absolute cluster that I've seen, uh, because yeah. business owners kind of get taken advantage of. Because one of the things that is is true is that we're always time poor i've never met a business owner who's who's said that they've just got more money well more time uh on their head well actually i know one that's julie fletcher uh <laughs> julie it's, fucking uh, fletcher. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty damn rare and and so what ends up happening is that all of the documents just go in and you can get set up in some pretty horrific scenarios and uh and just a little bit of strategic stuff, and, and it might even just be a 30-second conversation, but uh, yeah. a little bit of strategy can go a really, really long way for small to medium business owners. And uh, totally, man. and certainly yeah. when you've got good tax years, you've got to strike while the iron's hot, absolutely strike while the iron's hot. And um, here's, here's the other thing about the lending, though, Jace, as well, is what's actually happened with the current book of the banks is because the property prices have gone up, revaluing of the assets, their, their capital has actually increased based on the leverage of their book. So they've actually, they're satisfying greater amounts of capital based on their capital adequacy. Capital requirements. Ah, Correct. the LVRs Correct. have reduced Correct. because the values have gone up. Yeah, there Correct. you go. Yep, mate, so there's a bit more buffer. That's why you get paid the big bucks, mate. That's why you get paid the big bucks. You're all over that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a banker wanker anymore. That was, <laughs> not uh, anymore. That reform, was past, reform, reform, reform. That, that was a past <laughs> indiscretion. <laughs> uh, Luke just gave us a shout out. Any books that uh, deep dive into property? So, uh, Luke, a bit of a plug for Sam Saggers. Um, uh, he's uh, he's got a number of books. Tra- track them down, mate. Uh, either on Amazon or eBay or um, uh, or the likes. If you're in our mentoring program, Luke, you can grab them as part of the mentoring program. But um, the future of property investing in Australia um, is one that uh, Sam. Right there, and uh, Sags is my business partner, an absolute genius when it comes to the world of property. And mate, uh, track him down on uh, Urban Property Investor, his podcast, and he's got about fifty episodes in now. And mate, absolute gold every single one of them. So hopefully that helps you, buddy, um, as you're going along. And um, you know, make sure yeah you, you dive into that. It's great to hear that um, that you're getting into some education or wanting to get some education because that's really at the end of the day, the more you get to understand the markets that you're going to be investing in, you don't have to understand right down to the nitty-gritty but the, the basics of them, um, the, the good basics, not the media-led stupidity, um, uh, away you go. So, mate, uh, yeah, grab that, mate. Um, you know, it's a good read, um, certainly. Um, and uh, the other guy that I like, mate, um, is probably one of the only other property people who I, I would recommend uh, in Australia um, is Margaret Lomaz. She's she's quite a good um, property person. Uh, she's quite conservative, so um, she comes from a bit more of an accountant, financial planner background. But if you sort of hedge your bets between Sam and Margaret, um, you know you'll probably end up in a good place. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I just got a uh, an impromptu drive by just by Jace there. I think it just got thrown under the bus a little bit. I'm not quite sure, <laughs> mate. Uh, the, the old you got to hedge your bets when it comes to um, the the financial planning world and their love of property. Andy, you're a very rare uh, you're a very rare uh, uh, person when it comes to the world of planning. And so there there you go. Um, um, at the end of the day. The property world. I know. I know uh, you're a big fan of property as well as you know the combination of our asset classes. So you know, at the end of the day, I've, I've really I enjoyed you introducing me to uh, some interesting things. Actually, so <laughs> I love it good. all, mate. Like like I say, you don't always have steak when you go to the restaurant. Like you've got to yeah, have you've got to have a few things <laughs> on your plate to really enjoy the meal. And uh, yeah. and uh, look, and on the education piece, uh, Luke, I, that's a big applause from me because one of the, before I met Jace. And clients used to talk to me about jumping into the property market. A lot of the time, where I and, and a lot of them thought that I was trying to push them off it, and I really wasn't. But one of the things that I just found I find astounding, and it happens so regularly, is that 
people spend more time figuring out what car they're bloody going to buy, like yes. doing more research <laughs> about, and I shit you not, Jace, I, I, every single client uh, that I've had yeah. outside yeah. of your world who has gone and bought an investment property, um, and obviously we don't advise on investment property, but uh, have, they've gone out and bought it. They have done less research, and I've literally gone, so tell me about the, that car. What was the new car you got? Oh, the Ford. Ford, yeah, nice. Okay, so how many cylinders? Oh, it's five cylinders. Oh, so what's the torque? Oh, yeah, yeah, 520 newton meters worth of torque and, you know, at uh, zero to 100 and, and all of these bloody useless facts that they know about their car. <laughs> and then I spend the same amount of time asking them questions about the property, and they're like, uh, well, I, I paid 800000 for it and I've forgotten what the monthly payments are. Yeah. Like, are you it freaking it for, serious? I, I don't know what it rents for. Um, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, All right, and, then. <laughs> and so my my standard rule with clients, uh, you know, before we started chatting, Jace, was how long did it – and, and I, I go there first now. I, was, I strategically put the discussion about the car first. And go. How long did it take you to figure that one out? You know, and oh, I was probably a couple of months. I reckon I was I was deliberating of it, and I've gone. All right. So you want to get an investment property? It's taking a couple of months to pay it, to buy an eighty thousand dollar car. Now you want to buy an eight hundred thousand dollar car. And uh, so my suggestion to you is you double the amount of time that you spent researching the car, or so you times <laughs> it by ten, because that's how much more money you're going to be spending. And when you've done that much research, then you're probably willing and and a lot more you're walking in with your eyes open and yeah. uh that's sort of always been my advice so kudos to you luke i reckon um, more people should take more interest when dumping more cash <laughs> into things and uh, bloody lootly yeah you're dead right mate you're dead right he uh i've got a few other ones here um yeah luke reckons uh he, he likes that you went to Ford first, Andy. Like he sounds like Luke's a Ford guy. <laughs> we uh, we we just got we just got a Ranger, and uh, oh god, I love it. It is and just uh, I I feel I feel like a man when I get into the car, and there's, there's something. Oh. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ford so tough. <laughs> We're gonna get some haters from the Holden Brigade in a minute, Jason. We better move on. <laughs> Well, Andy, I think I I, I think I, I said this to Shay, but I, I was saying to you, like I was I was um, I was you and I were chatting about this. I, I was um, looking at upgrading my car, and um, I, I was very keen on the Ford Raptor. You know, very very similar to what you've got. And um, I was uh, I was, but the issue for me was it was a Ford. Um, you know, because I grew up as a Holden guy, right? So. Um, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's like I really like the car, but it's a Ford. If we could take the sticker off and put another sticker on, I'd probably buy it. <laughs> Mate, I, I remember it well. I remember it well. I was a Ford XF man. First, first proper car that wasn't a paddock bomb was uh, was a Ford XF. I can see thing. you in the Ford XF. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Station wagon, yeah. <laughs> red. Went nice and fast. Uh, oh, love uh, that car. Jeez, did mate. half a million Ks in that sucker. That's so good. My, my first car was a Holden HQ, and three on the tree. It was a beast. It was a. It was a good <laughs> with a with a straight six. Uh, it was fun. There you mate, go. I, I did. Uh, I did have a station wagon once. The uh, the Kingswood, and uh, I tell you what, I think I've, I think that that car has still got a little bit of my back skin on it because uh, <laughs> we were driving it down from Caratha up in. Uh, uh, up in WA, it was a 50 degree day, completely forgot about it. Went for a swim in the swimming hole, came back and sat down in the car, and tss, you could hear the back <laughs> sizzling on the, the leather bucket seats. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Uh, that That's such a that's such an Australian thing. Karen gave us a shout out, you know, what's the LVR on that type of lending, Karen? Um, you know, you can get up to 80% lending in Light Dock. Um, so, so that's perfectly fine. Um, eighty percent, eighty percent works. You you do you do get a bit of uh, you have to pay a little bit of um LMI at that at that level as well. So if it's under seventy percent with Light Dock, you don't pay the LMI. But if it's over seventy percent, you do. So you know um it, it there, there are some options out there when it comes to those things as well. So um keep an eye on on those. Give us a shout out if you need some help. Um. Andy, which financial agency is reasonable for SMSF loan? Um, so, do you, do you have any opinions on the SMSF lending world? 
I do know there's about five or six lenders out there that that do reasonably good SMSF lending at the moment, but the LVRs in SMSF lending to be safe are probably 60 to 70% um, is probably where you want to land it. 80% lending, it says it on the stickers, but it's very rare um, and you probably wouldn't want to push to that level anyway with your your investment properties. But um, any any feedback on that? Any thoughts on that one? No, mate, just mirror that. You know, you want to be conservative with your LVRs. Also, the, the cost of the interest is is significantly higher. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it should come down over time, but uh, there's enough complexity in there that you want to keep it reasonably low because what well, makes sense, doesn't it? If you're paying twice the interest rate or even three times the interest rate, if you've got a loan for half as much, you're probably going to be in a similar sort of cash flow position. And uh, when it comes to super, uh, cash cash flow is uh, is king. And uh, so you just yeah. got to watch that one because you, you just don't want to put yourself into a position whereby uh, somebody moves out, you don't get the cash in, and then you're forced to put money into your super fund and you might be quite young. Uh, you just want to avoid that uh, at all costs. Like you can do it, but then that's just money that you're going to tie up and and ultimately if just being a little bit more conservative can can serve you really, really well. Depends on yeah, the deal. Yeah. Depends on your circumstance. You don't want to be pouring the cash in too early, Andy. Yeah. That's that's my opinion, uh, and uh, and it's just give yourself flexibility and options. Yeah, yeah. Um, very important question, though. Um, this one's probably the most important one yet. So, Andy, did you have long flowing hair? Um, <laughs> back in the- <laughs> well, since you know me in a previous live, I had uh, <laughs> I had I had hair down to here. <laughs> and it was uh, it, it's super super curly, my hair, or, or it used to be, and so I'd go into these fat ringlets, uh, along to go on with my chubby little belly. Um, I was super fit. I was a, a I was playing for a uh, Victoria in, <laughs> in hockey, and and uh, so I was I was super fit, but I just just had a little bit of puppy fat on me. Didn't didn't grow up until a little bit later on, and at one point in time, Jace, it was peroxide uh, down to here as well, and. Uh, I was a broke musician at that point in time and uh, the hair started to grow out, so <laughs> the roots started growing out, so it was peroxide from here down to uh, there. I reckon uh, I reckon Margot could probably provide us with a couple of photos. <laughs> Margot, I'm giving, you a, I'm giving you a photo challenge on that one. <laughs> oh, mate, we, we, we just looked through some of them the other day and I'm like, there's some photos that should never see the light of day there, I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, I, I certainly uh, matched you on that one, Andy. I had uh, I had a very sporting mullet that was peroxide blonde, very Jason oh. Donovan esque um, back in the day. So uh, there you go. I can't I can't throw too much uh, crap your way, <laughs> mate. Well, style style definitely died in my hands. I can tell you that much. It was uh, it was. Uh, uh, I sort of look back on pictures of me with girlfriends, and I'm thinking. What was going through your head, woman? Like, honestly, what look I, at him. What were they thinking? The were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not much has changed. Mate. Not much has changed. <laughs> I, reckon, I reckon that's probably a good way to end the night, actually. Um, uh, 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 I'll just I'll touch on this. one more thing, mate, yeah. because it, it, is the, it. Uh, it is that time of the year. So with, with us and with our clients this time of the year, it's the end of the financial year, and so we use it for a reassessment of, of everything. So ideally, what you should be doing now is you should be looking at your entire financial foundation, right? So you should be having a look at all of these different areas, uh, and there we go. You should be having a look at all of these different areas in your life over the coming month, month and a half, maybe two months, uh, cash flow budgeting, your mortgages, your super, your investments, your insurance, personal insurance. Oh, we didn't answer those insurance questions, but maybe we'll get to that next week. Um, the tax and accounting, property portfolios, equipment leasing, uh, legal, wills, conveyancing, estate planning, all of those sorts of things. This is really what you need to be looking at uh, right now and starting to assess what the year ahead has planned for you. And if you follow the rhythms that we provide, uh, so our we split the year up into uh, into quarters. We, we're thinking about bringing it down to thirds, um, but at the moment it's in quarters. And it's uh, it, in January, it's all about New Year's resolution. It's all about um, having a look at your cash flow, but also replanting what, what is the number one focus for the year? What are we going to be focusing on financially? And setting the year up in line with your 10, 15, 20-year 
plan. Then when it comes to April, you've heard us say it before, it's uh, March, April, that's tax time for us because we want to start early and get prepared for it. In July, that's when we look at what we call a foundational review. So this is where you want to be looking at all of these different areas of your life and understanding, do I need to decrease my insurance? Do I need to increase it? You know, where is my mortgage? Do I look at refinancing soon? Uh, the beauty about doing stuff like that uh, now as well is, and now is a, a little bit different to normal years, most people are rushing to get their stuff in for the end of financial year. So typically brokers can actually have a little bit of a downtime after July, August. So it's a really good time to get in to them as well. If you want to increase the levels of your fight, keep topping it up every two, three years, yes. refinancing it, putting the money in the offset account uh, and doing all those sorts of things. So my big tip for everybody here of things that you should know uh, is that this is the time to be looking at your financial foundation, understanding how it fits in with the greater scheme, the greater plan that you've got, and really focusing in on any areas that just need tweaking. You don't have to adjust all of it. You just need to look at it and just see how it fits in. And I almost, I promise you, you'll look at at least one of them and you'll go, yep, thanks, Andy. Yeah, we should be tweaking that a little bit. And uh, and so now is the perfect time to do that uh, because then later on in the year, we get into then reshuffling and looking at our investments and things of that nature. So that's uh, just my little two cents worth as a little tip of something that you should know and something that you should be doing right now is the end of financial year. No, mate, that's a great tip. Certainly, Certainly, uh, bringing it back into focus for us all is um, is always worth doing at uh, certain sections of the year. So, um, no, great, uh, good shout out. That's for sure. And what I might do if uh, if anyone's listening in, I might get you to come uh, as a guest. I, I, I thought we might uh, be able to do it today, but maybe Monday or Tuesday again. Maybe drop by on uh, on Wealth Coffee Chats and we can talk about that life insurance borrowing thing because that's um, that's something that it comes up a bit, and uh, I think that'd be a great. Uh, a great chat when it comes to those things, man. So um, 100%. that'd be be awesome. Well, brother, great to chat with you, folks. Um, Thanks for joining us. Uh, Appreciate you guys popping by and supporting the channel and supporting us, um, supporting you. And uh, great to see you guys in there um, as we're going along and, um, you know, giving us some questions. Hardik asked one question. Hardik, I'm going to answer that for you next week. So um, keep an eye out. uh, keep you coming back, Hardik. I know you pop by on uh, on uh, on Wealth Coffee chats as well, mate. So I'll see you Monday morning, Hardik. All right, it's all that's all for you. I'll get you right onto that one. Is building defect work done to be added to expensive investment property appreciation schedule? I'll copy that one as we go. Good on you, gang. Um, great to have you guys hanging out on a Friday night. You guys have fun. Have an awesome weekend. Thanks for joining us, Andy. One wealth and wisdom done again for another week. Cheers, Take care, my friend. Cheers, everyone. Join us again yeah. next week. Um, it's a good night Friday. from me. <laughs> and it's a good night from him. Good night.